Welcome to Spirit and Truth. I'm Todd Kleppe. And I'm Andrew Gabriel Roth. And today we've got a very special message. Uh, Andrew's actually been working for 25 years on this subject. And he's been able to get some revelations from the Father and also some data um, from different places. Mm -hmm. And everything from celestial uh, data, uh, the stars, the moon, and, and all kinds of references mm -hmm. uh, regarding the star of Bethlehem. And not just the star of Bethlehem, but all the other amazing things that are happening around the star of Bethlehem. And that's a whole other glorious story on top of the one that's pointing to the birth of the Messiah. And it needs to be told. Yes. I'm excited because I think this is very groundbreaking. I think it's going to open up people's minds and, mm -hmm. and hopefully, and as we always encourage you to check everything that we say here. Absolutely. And, and test it. Yep. Because uh, that's doing your due diligence. But, Andrew, this subject is a subject that's been talked about for many years. Mm -hmm. Different people. Mm -hmm. About how many different ideas are there out there? From what I've read personally, uh, I believe more than two dozen separate theories that have been publicly vetted that have had some funding behind them and production behind them that I know of, wow. either on YouTube or through Hollywood or through other things. Wow. And there seems to be two different camps in that as well. Yeah. There's two different approaches, uh, and each approach has two different camps. And what I mean by that is there are scenarios that are done by believers, mm -hmm. Messianics, Christians, who really look at the Bible as history, and they've simply come to a difference of opinion about biblical dates. Uh, there's basically a scenario that has the Messiah being born somewhere between the years 7 and 4 BC, and of course there's different opinions as to where that falls into, and I'm going to give you mine, yeah. right? And then there are those who think that Messiah was born right around 1 BC, this has to do with early church tradition and the Julian calendar, which you don't quite use anymore. Right. Um, and so we have these, these two different believing camps uh, for the birth. We also have them splitting on the year of his death along the same lines. There are those who will say his, he, the death and the resurrection is in the spring of 30. And there are those who will put it three years later at 33. Wow. Uh, that's, as I said, from the believer's yeah. standpoint. But there's also skeptics that want to come in here. And the skeptics come in and they want to destroy the integrity of the biblical narrative. And for them, they're going to say that you can't figure out what the star of Bethlehem was. It's a folktale. You can't figure out anything from the Gospels because they come late first century. You can't trust Luke. He's a dozen years off. He, he doesn't get the census right. He doesn't get other things right. And, and they don't then replace it with their own theories. It's like they want to lay their bombs around parts of this and blow the whole thing up and just sort of leave the mess. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very disturbing. And it's unfortunately very popular in academia today yeah. uh, to try to undermine the integrity of the scripture. And my job is kind of to be a liaison between the academic world, and I know the language and the jargon that they speak, yes. uh, and to relate to the public what's really going on. Yeah. So we've got a lot of situations where we're swimming uphill against a skeptical tide, but we also have to bring our A game. It's not just enough to say, well, I believe Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. We also have to prove we know astronomy uh, very well, that we can interpret historical data from Josephus and Philo, archaeological finds that have an impact yeah. on this. So there's a whole bunch of multi-related disciplines that need to be brought to bear to deal with whether we're talking about the disputes between believers about the dates or the, the, those from the skeptics who are trying to destroy the, the story of Messiah from the outside. Yeah. So, and that's basically what we're going to try to address in, in these videos. That's great. You know, I've had the privilege of, of seeing some of the, the things that Andrew, you, you study from. 
mm -hmm. uh, over 4,000 <laughs> scrolls or yeah. uh, documents, manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And in those manuscripts, um, you've been able to uh, translate Aramaic into, into English, and you've done other things with that. And I say this because your teaching that you did on archaeology, you were able to, to show even the Creator's name being dated back way back in, in, mm -hmm. in BC, like 2000. 2000 BC, uh, <laughs> right before the time of Abraham, we have cuneiform documents, and cuneiform is unique in the ancient languages at the time in that it has full vowels. And so we know exactly how they pronounce the name because it's right there in the text. Uh, so that's, that's a remarkable situation. We have also ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic inscriptions of the name of the Hebrew God. And I bring that up because you had to have a starting point of being able to, to clarify this is when the Exodus happened, this is when this happened. Right, right. And, and when we're talking also about the manuscripts, because the other area is, well, how do we know that our, our, the Bible is reliable? How do we know that our Heavenly Father has preserved His Word? Uh, this is my answer for you. There's a, a database that comes in advanced biblical software like BibleWorks and Accordance and some others called the CNTTS, the Center for New Testament Textual Studies. It has nearly 4,000 digitized manuscripts. Wow. Okay, uh, and those manuscripts, I can go to Matthew 1 verse 1 and see every manuscript witness, hundreds and hundreds of them, and every single variation within every text with the click of a mouse. I can literally see 500 of those manuscripts with a click of the mouse. So when I say that Father Yah has preserved his word, I'm talking about something that's not just of my faith. I'm talking about something that's in the real world that I can prove if we have the time to prove it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And the Star of Bethlehem similarly has a number of things that rest on linguistic uh, understanding of Aramaic and Greek. Uh, as well, particularly as we'll get into this, it, the term from the east is singular or plural. It, yeah. That's a huge, huge issue to being able to figure out what the Magi actually saw. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll get into that. I mean, these are, these are the things that, yeah. these are the pieces to the puzzle, in other words. So we're laying some groundwork here that this isn't something you just dreamt up yesterday and no. said, hey, this is when it all lines up. Indeed, no. I mean, this has been the work of going back more than a quarter century. And I had help. I had a professional astronomer with, uh, with special software that the general public doesn't have that assisted me with, with these things. Uh, he, I call him my science advisor. And he basically, you know, did classified work for NASA and the Department of Defense. He was worked on satellite technology. Wow. Uh, and so when he was able to really show how these things come together, it really helped confirm the historical and the calendar research that I've, that I've always been fascinated and been doing. Um, and that's just one example of the help that I got. Uh, having the Bible software and access to a bunch of manuscripts in Aramaic and Greek uh, is also very helpful in terms of forming the core historical base of the nativity stories in Matthew and Luke. That's very, very important. Yes. Having a manuscripts of Josephus, our first century witness, and Philo, another first century witness, also help round out this, and along with, uh, you know, biblical archaeology. So it's a whole series of intersecting lines of evidence that we use to paint this picture, this interdisciplinary picture of not just what King James said, but what was actually done at the time. And if we do it right, I truly believe we can stamp your passport back to the first century. That's exciting. I really believe that's what we can, we can do. Yeah. So. I just have one more thing I want to add, and then we'll jump right into this because this is a very long teaching and it's a very good and detailed teaching. What then would you say, because you've been working on this for 25 years, mm -hmm. and what do you think uh, any advantages you, you might have had over people in the past, um, in the 1800s, the 1700s, early 1900s? What, what are some things that have helped you that maybe 
they didn't have access to or right well for for one thing uh we've only had telescopes since about 1600 wow so <laughs> anything prior to galileo uh you know looking at jupiter in that particular night in, uh in, in the early 1600s anything prior to that was done by the naked eye and that can sometimes you know lead to issues you know distortions and things of that nature it depends on the the if the night was cloudy and other things that are going on so that's one series of things the other series of things is a lot of the best biblical manuscripts that we have now have only come about in the last couple hundred years so even if you look at say what happened with king james being compiled in 1611 and this guy erasmus who had those manuscripts we got way, way better manuscripts than Erasmus did. Wow. And the Dead Sea Scrolls and a bunch of other things that were not around or were not known. They were around, but they were not yeah. known uh, 400 years ago. So that's going to really help us with, you know, get better information because our sources are better now. Yeah. You got advanced Bible software technology that can collate these verses, as I've already said, across hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts. Nobody could have done that even 25 years ago. Yeah. Right? You'd have to go one museum at a time, one, wow. uh, one university at a time, and you would be able to look at the manuscripts for a couple of hours, and then you couldn't photograph them, and you couldn't take them outside, and you could, you know, and now you have, through the, the digital technology, we have stuff online with the Vatican and with the British Library and with other things that we can see them 24-7. We can go in and, and get better views of those manuscripts than if you were actually handling the manuscript. Yeah. So there's a whole uh, series of technologies and innovations that make this much easier to do now. And there's also astronomical software some of it absolutely free, uh, that can very accurately reconstruct the night skies from 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that uh, will really seal it, I think, because then people can see a picture of what the sky looked like in 7 BC. They don't just have to imagine it. I can show you what it looks like. But I think another advantage that you bring into this is your understanding of the Semitic culture yeah, and the Semitic languages. Um, you have an understanding of of the priest and the priest schedule and those things. Yes, too. that's another piece of it as well. Yeah. Uh, some of it has to do with understanding what the the Aaronic priests, what was their calendar like? How do we know, for example, when uh, Zacharias, who is the Baptist father, how do we know when he was burning incense in the temple? Because that's about 15 months before the birth. So getting that date right really helps narrow down when, when the Messiah would be born. And that's a whole other story as yeah. well. So we got a lot of sort yes. of side issues as well as main issues uh, to discuss and go work through one at a time. So without any further ado, our time scale or our, our timeline is going to be from what to what? We're going to be tracking astronomical and other significant historical data from May of 7 BCE to August of 2 BCE. Okay. That particular five year and change period when the skies are literally exploding with um, not just dramatic astronomical phenomena, but astronomical phenomena that is tied to giving a particular message tied in many cases to happening on specific days of the Hebrew calendar, yeah. as well as th very rare. Like for example, when we get to the uh, conjunctions in 7 BC, that's only happened once since 7 BC. It happens every 1400 to 1500 years. Wow. And that <laughs> was something the Magi knew were rare, was rare, that got their attention, you know. Uh, and there's a lot of them that are like that. Not everyone's falling on a, on a, on a key Hebrew date, but many of these events do. So, uh, so I know the listeners at home are probably sitting there going, Andrew, Andrew, when's the date? When's the date? Is that, <laughs> how do you want to handle that? Well, I think we need to unroll it uh, a, a bit systematically. Okay. And the reason is this. I can give you that date, and, and some of you will be, oh, that's, that's nice. And others are going to be like, well, prove it. And you're right. 
I need to prove it. Exactly. I absolutely have to prove it. Yeah. So I can't do that by just throwing out a date, whatever that date is, and then saying, take my word for it, the science and the math agree, blah, 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 blah. We, I have to make my case. All right. I have to make my case like a lawyer, almost, assembling the evidence, exhibit A, exhibit B, yeah. and let's move through it together so we can empower you, that journey together and hopefully most of you, many of you, will come to the same conclusion that I have based on the evidence not opinion. I love it. That's so, one of the things I love about your work is you 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 show your work and you're not just pulling a date. No. So let's transport back to 7 BCE and, and get going. Okay. So 7 BCE uh, is are events that are only recorded by Matthew. Now I don't think I'm giving away too much to say that Yeshua was born in 5 BCE. Um, and at the time that Yeshua was being born, when the Magi went to see Herod, the, the, Herod wanted to know, how long have you been tracking this star? Because they said, we saw the king's star. So we need to deal with what the king's star is. And who the Magi are. And who the Magi are, and all this other <laughs> stuff. Uh, I mean, every, every question that's answered leads to... Another question. Another question. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the bottom line is this. Uh, the Magi tell Herod that, that, it, that they've been tracking that star for two years. And we know that because Herod then says, and he ordered the execution of the infants in Bethlehem two years and under according to the information that he got from the Magi. It says that directly. Wow. So... Most of the possible candidates for the, the, the star of Bethlehem are not trackable for two years. So that right away is going to eliminate a whole bunch of possibilities. This, this just You can't track them for that long. And the way that the king star moves is also going to eliminate other phenomena. Fixed stars just rise and set. This is not what the star of Bethlehem is. Hmm. But But... A certain kind of wandering star called planete, uh, wandering stars don't just do this, they go across. And so that right away is going to greatly narrow down our possible list of, of what the star of Bethlehem is. So having said all that, let's talk about the Magi and let's talk about 7 BCE. Okay. Okay. So who are the Magi? Well, you may have noticed that magi kind of sounds like the word magic. And that's not a coincidence. The word magi is where you get the word magic. The magi are astronomer priests from Babylon. Daniel was in Babylon and was made the head of their order. That's mentioned in the book of Daniel, that he was made the chief of the magicians. And from the magicians, you get magi. So that's the first thing. They are not Jewish themselves. But they are, you know, in a place in Babylon with a very large Jewish community. So they're going to be familiar with Hebrew culture, Hebrew feast days, uh, other things that are going on. Because there's, th th that area is, is tremendously packed with, 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 with Jews at the time. And that's because of most of the Jews that were in Babylon for 70 years did not return under Ezra. 80% of them stayed behind. It's sort of a little, yeah. uh, it, it, it's sort of a little bit of a surprising fact, but it's true. They flourished in Babylon for the next 700 years after that, including into the early centuries of this era. Uh, and so the Magi would have known all about Hebrew sensibilities, their timings, what they believed, even though they weren't, you know, followers of that. Yeah. They were members of a religion called Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism had a belief that the king of the world was going to be proclaimed in the heavens, their version of the Messiah, and that the, the king of the world was going to be born in the land to the west. Israel is exactly due west. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jerusalem is exactly due west of Babylon. You can practically draw a straight line between two points, Babylon here and, and Jerusalem there. 
I just want to clarify something. Daniel, even though he was the head of this group of people, didn't believe in their religion. No, of course not. Right. No. I just want to clarify that. No, he did saying. not. Uh, but, you know, that was also in part one of the issues that came up against Daniel. Yeah. He wasn't one of them, and yet he was in charge of all these <laughs> other people who supposedly had more experience, who were better connected to the king. Didn't matter. Yeah. You know, and so that's why in the book of Daniel, it's very important to note that when his enemies try to figure out how to scandalize him, they can't, they can't do it through any of the traditional ways. They can't do it with women. They can't do it with alcohol. They can't do it with, with, with money. He's incorruptible. So yeah. what do they do? They use his Torah observance against him yeah. by, by, by making it illegal for him to not worship the statue of the king. And so just it, that kind of proves what, what yeah. we were just talking about. Yeah. Daniel uh, you know, does not give up his religion even though he is in charge of others who have another religion. Right. And as I said, the Zoroastrians were looking for their version of the Messiah to be proclaimed in the heavens. It was already hardwired into their religion. And that's why the leaders of that religion are particularly gifted in astronomy. Okay? Also, it's important to note that the head of the Parthian Empire, the emperor, was also Zoroastrian. Okay? And so these would all these magi would have been ambassadors. They would have been representatives of the greatest empire other than Rome on the planet. Wow. So when they go to knock on King Herod's door, trust me, Herod is going to receive them. He does not want to make the Parthian emperor mad. Right. You know, because he'll have all they'll have all the credentials proving who they are. Yeah. So this is sort of setting this up that something is about to happen that the Magi are going to start to think about getting ready to do a 660 mile pilgrimage from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now earlier you stated that you really couldn't, they didn't have telescopes back then. So the things that are visible in the sky that they can see are like the moon, the stars, the constellations. Yep. And yep. that's their tools they're gonna use. That's pretty much it. I mean, you're talking about the big stuff that's easily seen. Like for example, we, we now think of, you know, uh, well, when I grew up, uh, Pluto was, 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 was the ninth planet, but then somehow Pluto got demoted and now we only got eight, uh, however that is. But uh, the point is, anciently, they could only see five planets, wow. you know, uh, and the five planets that they would see uh, were basically uh, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then you add the sun and the moon and you have seven big celestial spheres, one for every day of the week. And that's where we get a lot of our days from. <laughs> you know, Sunday, yeah. Sun's Day, yeah. Monday, Moon's Day, and so on. Wow. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know that. So in dealing with, with all of that, they're going to be looking at two different kinds of stars. The kind that rise and set are called fixed because from our position on earth they really don't move. Now of course everything moves but you won't see one of these fixed stars change position uh, unless you are looking at it every night for 72 years it'll, it'll go backwards a degree. And that's what we call precession of the equinoxes. Uh, but that's obviously very slow. Sure. Okay. But they, the Magi are not necessarily caring too much about the fixed stars. The fixed stars are just sort of like pinpoints on a map that tell you where stuff is. Uh, they're looking at the stuff that's going to streak us across the sky, that's going to move in a different way. Wow. And so what ends up happening is they will be watching two big planets appear to come together in the, in the night sky. And those two planets are Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, Jupiter is named after the chief Greco-Roman de deity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the planet of the king. Okay. Just bear that in mind, right? Now Saturn is almost as big as Jupiter, and of course it's got its rings, so it's also very impressive. But remember I said that the planets, the visible heavenly spheres, gave birth to the days of the week? Yeah. So Saturn's day becomes Saturday. And only the Jewish people venerated Saturday as a Sabbath. 
So while Jupiter becomes associated with kingship, Saturn becomes known as sort of the protector planet for the Jews. Wow. Now, maybe not every culture is going to see that, but as I said, the Magi were from Babylon, where there was a huge Jewish population there, so they would have definitely factored these people into their astrology. Yes. Okay, if that makes sense. So you have constellations that also represent things too, correct? Right, right. The 12 so-called uh, belt constellations of, of the zodiac. And without getting overly technical, because you can easily drown in technicality yeah, yeah, yeah. here, uh, there's basically a, a, an imaginary belt of stars that wraps around from what they viewed as a heliocentric, you know, uh, an Earth-centered situation. They view the Earth as fixed and everything else is revolving around it. Yeah. That's not how we look at it today. Right. Uh, but from that perspective, you would have th this belt of stars that would represent gods or animals that were going always eastwards around the Earth. And for about 30 days, one of those groups of stars would be visible for when the, when the, when the sun would rise. Sure. And so they would go, oh, okay, this is the first constellation of, of, of spring. They thought it was Aries, a ram, and so on. And that's what they're looking at. Those zodiac stars are also identified with people and places. One of those is Pisces. Pisces is also associated with the Jewish people, not necessarily the geography where they are, because Leo the lion is the lion of Judah. Yeah. But, but the ethnicity of these people, because Jonah got swallowed by a big fish and Pisces is the sign of the fish. Gotcha. So in May of 7 BCE, the 29th, this is when you had the king's planet, Jupiter, appear to merge with the savior planet of the Jews in Pisces, in the sign of the Jews. And so the, the Magi would have interpreted that and said, that means the Jewish king is going to be born in the sign of the Jews. He's coming soon. Not yet, but coming soon. Let's start tracking this. Because a single conjunction of these two planets is not rare at all. You can do it in 20 years. But if you start getting multiple witnesses in the same part of the sky, yeah. That gets rarer and rarer. And if those conjunctions in turn hit particular Hebrew dates that the Magi know are significant for the Jews, yeah. that's an even greater level of rarity and, and challenge that they're looking at. Right. So May 29th, basically, uh, in, in 7 BC, and by the way, all my dates are Gregorian, not Julian calendar. Right. Okay. May 29th at night had just changed into the third day of the third month, which is Sivan. Why is that an important date? It's important basically because on the third day of the third month, Father Yah descended in fire onto Mount Sinai to announce that the Ten Commandments were coming. That's in Exodus 19. On the third day of the third month, that's when Father Yah is, in, is, is telling Israel, Get ready, get yourself clean, I'm going to announce the law. In what year do you believe that was? Oh, easily 1447 BCE. Yes. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, but that's way back. That's way, way back. Yeah. So here on the exact same Hebrew day is when Father Yah begins announcing the birth of the Torah made flesh that will be his only begotten son. I don't think that is a coincidence. No. Right? So again, but if it was just that conjunction, the Magi might have said, oh, that's nice, and they would have moved on. But then, only a few months later, we get to October 1st, they see the same exact thing again. Wow. <laughs> and that same exact conjunction with the same exact meanings in the same part of the sky, everything the same, October 1st, which is Yom Kippur. Hmm. The Day of Atonement. So the most sacred day on the Jewish calendar. So now they know this is definitely about those Jewish people. It's not just any people to our West. 
It's these people who are to our west. And this king must be a righteous king because he brings the day of atonement. So they're like, okay, now this definitely has our attention. This is not just a garden variety thing. We've got a confirming witness here. At this point, I could imagine the Magi are thinking, We're, we really, we really could, should think about going. But remember, it's a 660 mile journey and the weather is turning cold. Uh, are you really going to go if your signs are not complete? If you're not 100% sure? I don't think so. And then the third time that it happens, just two months later, Wow. On December 4th, same conjunction, the Jupiter, the planet of the king, and Saturn, the savior protector planet of the Jews, Saturn's day, in Pisces, the sign of the Jews. But this hits on the 15th day of the ninth month of Kislev. Hmm. That is a cursed day. Okay? That is the day that a, a Syrian Greek tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes, invaded with a massive army and put pig's blood on the altar that is in front of the temple and defiled the temple. This caused years of conflict, thousands and thousands of deaths, called the Maccabean Revolt. And then the temple had to be cleaned up and rededicated, and it's what we commemorate every year as Hanukkah. But for, for the Magi, who know this is now about the Jews, they got the Yom Kippur sign, they know that th this land is to their west. Now they, they see that this is on this horrible day for the Jewish people. And then just a couple days later, on December 7th, Jupiter and Saturn do this. They, they, they break up, right? Yeah. And so they're like, okay, obviously nothing's going to happen. Nothing to see here. But remember that something is going to happen at some point. Yeah. Just not now. So, so, so that's the end of the signs in 7 BC. They're waiting for more to see if it's time for them to go. But this is setting up for the next series of signs in the following year, which is 6 BC. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about 6 BC. First thing that we need to look at is that 6 BC is more about Luke than it is about Matthew. We know that from Matthew's perspective, since he already told us, the Magi are tracking this star for two years, that that would include 6 BCE. Yeah. And there were a number of astronomical things that were happening in 6 BCE. Uh, for example, I will go to February of 6 BC. You have a group conjunction of four, three planets and the moon. Okay, within eight degrees, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, and the moon jammed together again in Pisces. Yeah. So, so again, you're getting this Jupiter and Saturn, we've already gone over, the king and the savior. Mars is the planet for war. Mars is the name of the Greek god of war. So this is talking about, this is a bad omen. This is like war may be coming in to the houses where, of, of this world king that you're waiting on. Well, I'm not going to travel if war might be imminent, so I'm staying home, right? Yeah. You see that? <laughs> That's powerful. Yeah. I have a question. I don't mean to go back or anything, but Luke has gotten a bad rap because many have said in the, nowadays that um, he was off by, by... 10, 12 years. Yeah. We're going to get to Luke in a second. Okay. I'm, I'm getting get anxious. To, I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, That's all right. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, but I did want to also say... The other important sign in 6 BCE is that when the Hebrew year was beginning, which begins with the first month of spring, called mm -hmm. Habib, mm -hmm. when that happened, the planet Jupiter, which is the king's planet, is blocked by the new moon for oh, two wow. days. And then Jupiter goes behind the sun for the rest of that whole first month of spring. It disappears from the sky. So if you're looking for the king, the king has just disappeared. Wow. So you know, it's sort of like, and since this is at the very start of the Hebrew year, it's like the king's not coming this year. So you can just forget about it. <laughs> and that's basically all you need to know 
uh, about 6 BCE from Matthew's Magi astronomers tracking him, wow. which then brings us to to Luke. Okay. Okay. So so let's go back and talk about Luke. Luke is a, a very very careful historian. He explains that he's interviewed eyewitnesses of, of the word. Um, he uh, is extremely detailed and careful in how he assembles his sources. He's writing to a powerful man named Theophilus, mm -hmm. who I believe was actually a sitting high priest. Uh, that's a whole other story. But the, the point about that is, if you know you're writing for someone who is great and powerful, you better make sure you got your facts straight. I think so. You better be very, very <laughs> careful and make sure that you're bringing forth your witnesses properly, uh, and, and so on. And so that's uh, what, what happens with respect to Luke and his credibility, okay? And let's talk about this census. According to Luke, there was uh, a census done by a guy named Quirinius, uh, who was actually a very powerful Roman. He was a senator. He was a proconsul. That's a very high elevated rank. Um, and Quirinius, the first census of Quirinius, the governor of Syria, he says. Um, Josephus tells us that in 6 AD, Quirinius did a census. And that was because Herod's son, Archelaus, had gotten into trouble. He got booted out of power his properties went to the governor of Syria. When that happened, they had to do a census for the exchange of property. Yeah. Since Josephus says this very, very clearly, the uh, idea is that Luke confused that 6 AD census with one that would have been before the birth. And so my job was to look at the facts and basically determine that there was another census that was in the right time that was done by Quirinius in 6 BC. Wow, that's, which, that's it, big. It's big. <laughs> uh, I, I say this knowing that a lot of professional academics are going to say, we don't believe there was a census in 6 BCE. I'm just being honest. They're going to say that. But I looked at Josephus. I looked at actual inscriptions about Quirinius, and I believe they did a, a hatchet job on only putting that 6 AD census and going, that's the one, and assuming that Luke is off by about a dozen years. Wow. So let's talk about yeah. why there was a census in 6 BCE, and Luke is telling the truth. What are reasons people had censuses back then? Well, basically what happens is you conquer territory, you're going to need to count the value of, of what you've just captured. There are two stages. One is what Luke calls the apographe, the writing down, the registration. Then several years later, and the time between the two stages can vary, you would have the apodemosis, which is the actual payment of it. So if you conquered territory during a war, that territory's gotta be registered. If you go from tax status to tax, if you go from tax-free status and now you have to pay tax, you also okay. have to have to go through the registration process. Okay. Okay. So, what basically ended up happening, and this is a much much longer story than we can get into, uh, even in, in even in this, which is the long <laughs> version of this story. Uh, Evidence that there was this census in 6 BC. First thing that I noticed when looking at Josephus in his book Antiquities, uh, book 17, verse 42, was that the Romans demanded that the Pharisees sign a fealty oath, a loyalty oath to them. Uh, that's kind of weird. Why would they do that? They also refused to sign the loyalty oath, and Herod s slaughtered thousands of them. Wow. Yeah. Herod the Great killed thousands of these rabbis who would not sign a loyalty group uh, to Rome. Why was it so important to do that? And the answer is we know that when you've had a province that has paid low or no taxes for a long time, 
and now they're about to pay more or they're about to pay tax for the first time. It was common practice to make the leaders sign a loyalty oath that they were not going to rebel. So this is something that absolutely would have been done if a census was coming. Sure. Okay? Now, why would Herod, who had enjoyed a very good relationship with the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar, why would he uh, now go from being a tax-free or a low-tax client to being a fully taxed client? And the answer is Augustus caught Herod in a lie. Hmm. Okay, according to Josephus, what happened was Herod hated this Arab king uh, named Aretas, who lived near the Dead Sea. And Herod wanted to go to war with this Arab king. Augustus, though, and the Arab king were buddy-buddy. Hmm. So Augustus said, you will not touch him. I, I want an oath to you from you, Herod, that you will not go to war against Aretas. Herod said, I, I won't, I, 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 you know, I promise. But he broke his word. Hmm. He was caught getting ready to attack Aretas. The soldiers were terrified of having now the Roman emperor, the leader of the whole world, basically going, why did you lie? And Augustus made it clear to the soldiers, I, you're not in trouble. You're only in trouble if you lie to me now. Tell me what happened. Did your king authorize this attack? Or are you going against the king's will and mine? They said, no, it was all Herod. He deliberately disobeyed you. So then Augustus wrote a letter. He doesn't even want to do a personal visit. Augustus is like, he's really, really <laughs> mad. And so he says in the letter, according to Josephus, that whereas before I had treated you as a friend, now I will use you as a subject. These two terms, friend and subject, have specific meanings in Roman law. Julius Caesar used them uh, prior to this. And when Julius Caesar talked about friends and subjects, it was basically friends don't pay, subjects do. So Herod's shifting in ta from, from low tax to major tax would have triggered a census, which would have triggered the loyalty oaths, which would have triggered the rebellion against the loyalty oaths. And Herod is already in trouble, is going to slaughter the Pharisees to keep Rome happy. So this is a very, very tight situation historically. We know it's happening in 7 and 6 BCE. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is that what Yeshua meant when he said, you're no longer servants but friends? Yeah. That's, wow. He's actually using that same terminology because after all, Judea is a Roman province. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's a good point. <laughs> right? So here's the other thing. Quirinius. Luke says it's the first census of Quirinius as governor of Syria. The problem that a lot of folks have, a lot of historians have, is that in 6 BCE, the, the governor of Syria is a guy named uh, Saturnius. And so they go, Luke doesn't get his facts right. Saturnius is governor in 6 BC. Quirinius is not. But, the, but they've made a fatal flaw in their logic. The fatal flaw is that the governor, this term that is used as governor, only it relates to the senior Roman official of a province. That's not true. Hmm. The word hegemon actually can be about military leaders and other important Roman leaders who come in to support the civilian governor. Hmm. Okay? And so what we found is that one of the titles that is translated from hegemon is prefect and proconsul. Quirinius was both wow. a prefect and a proconsul. So he is a hegemon. The other thing is, people think, well, he, he would have only have done the censuses later in his career. Actually, in 10 BC, Quirinius did a census in Syria of 117,000 people. That's huge. <laughs> and it's right next door to Herod's kingdom that has now become taxable. 
You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So he, he, he already had the title. He already had the access. He already had the experience. And there was really nobody else who could have done it at the time. So this is why the idea that Quirinius could have only done it later in his career is, is, is incorrect historically. Hmm. Okay. So, and, and the reason that I know those facts, by the way, about the, the uh, 117,000 person census and about uh, Quirinius' titles is because we have actual inscriptions from those years about Quirinius, Roman, records. Wow. So that's uh, about as good as it's going to get and it totally disproves this idea that the Quirinius couldn't or wouldn't have done a 6 BC census. Wow. Okay. Another issue though about this is that Luke says that the whole world was going to be taxed. The whole Roman world was going to be taxed. And if there was this census in 6 BC, as I believe there was, it would have been a local census. So the other critique that we get is that was not an empire-wide census. Well, the, the registration may have been local due to events happening politically in Herod's kingdom. Yeah. But there was an empire-wide tax payment only four years later. <laughs> okay. And, th and so Luke is not saying the whole world was, was, get, was registering. He's saying the whole world was taxed. And that global tax wow. happened in 2 BC. In 2 BC, what happened was Augustus celebrated a jubilee, which is like 50 years in power, something like that. And it was the 750th anniversary of the founding of the Roman state. And for that information, I have actually Augustus's own words wow. about this going on, uh, called the Deeds of the Divine Augustus. His own autobiography bears witness to this. This is some good stuff. Right. And then the final thing that is said against Luke is that, well, the idea that Joseph and Mary would have been forced to go to Bethlehem was not required in Roman censuses, to which I say totally untrue. And I actually have Roman records from 48 AD and from 104 AD, censuses that were done in Egypt, again, next door, that absolutely required people to return to their home districts as a condition of registering, not paying for, but registering their property. And so, check, 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 and check. Everything that Luke has said, that these critics have said, he, he didn't get the right time, he didn't get the right circumstances, he didn't get the right governor, all this sort of stuff is totally turned back. Luke is telling the truth. His skeptics are not. So here's the next question then. Why would Joseph have property in, in Bethlehem? Well, th just go to... The Gospel of Luke. Yeah. He's a direct descendant of King David. Is he not? Yeah. And the interesting thing is that he is descended from the non-royal son, from Nathan. Ah. Okay. If he was descended from Solomon, he would have inherited Jerusalem. <laughs> but he's not going to Jerusalem to register. He's going to Bethlehem. Yeah. And Nathan has a separate inheritance in Bethlehem because that was the city David was from, as opposed to Jerusalem, the city he was king from. So this will set up and explain a whole bunch of other things, such as why are they able to go, is Joseph able to go to a house so quickly after the birth? The answer is he already owned the house. Wow. It was already part of his property in Bethlehem. That solves that problem. Yes, it certainly does. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, this is the type of thing that you just need to do your detective work. You just need to do your homework uh, before you, you, you say categorically, Luke is wrong by 12 years and all of these other things. D do the actual work. Um, the other thing that I, that I was able to establish is that when you had that empire-wide tribute to Augustus, which is what yeah. the Roman records call it, 
the word is from a Latin tributum. And tributum doesn't just mean tribute, it also means tax payment. Wow. So Luke, looking at those two events, it's not like they had a Roman Freedom of Information Act where he could have proven absolutely that that 2 BC pay payment was for the 6 BC registration, mm -hmm. but it was very likely that it was, and it would be very natural for him to go, okay, here's my empire-wide tributum, my empire-wide tax, and in those days, Caesar Augustus said that all the world should be taxed. <laughs> I think one of the big things that you, you have that many people don't is you can't just go to Blue Letter Bible and, and get a Hebrew or a Greek version of the words. You're a linguist and you understand deeper things with these words. And I appreciate that because not everybody is a linguist. And that's what you're bringing to this as well. Mm -hmm. And it's huge because some of the meanings of these words like you've just shown us are very important. Yep, absolutely. And uh, as we get ready to wrap up this part, this part one, we're going to next get into 5 BCE. The good stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is the actual birth year of Yeshua in 5 BC. And there's gonna be a lot of spectacular events that are going to lead the Magi to Yeshua. And there's also going to be a lot of amazing events after the birth that are going to be playing out in the heavens. And we'll deal with both of those in part two. Awesome. All right. Well, until next time, Shalom. Shalom. Gets me through the day Helps show me the way And who is not hard to be found Who has set me free Brings me to my knees And some say that you don't care you're leaving us on our own And some say that you have died Powerless and alone But as it was in the beginning It is now until the end And though you go by many names I call you Yahweh, my friend I remember what my life was like before I felt so abused, bitter and confused But then something stirred deep inside my soul It made things alright Brought me to the light And some say that you don't care You're leaving us on our own And some say that you have died Powerless and alone But as it was in the beginning It is now until the end And though you go by many names I call you Yahweh my friend and though you go by many names I call you Yahweh my friend